Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv, so ivdi. International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash INV, and we'll get you the information that you need. Uh, ever recommend staging dentistry procedures? And that that's a great question, Morgan, and that is certainly an option. If you have a certain number of procedures scheduled for the day. Let's say that you've scheduled four dentistry cases for the day. And you're doing x-rays, and you're doing evaluations, and you're doing cleaning. That's probably all you can schedule. You might be able to do five. <clears throat> but if you're doing that type of approach, then, or if you're, if you're maybe doing one or two cases a day, you don't have time to do these cases in the way that I've described where you're doing flaps, surgical extractions, cleaning up, and suturing multiple teeth, which most of these small breed dogs and cats with perio and or tooth resorption are. Those are two, two and a half, three hour procedures. So you make the diagnosis, you do the evaluation, and you get the patient back and you allow two and a half hours to three hours per patient. So that puts two a day or one a day with other procedures in the afternoon, uh, however you want to work that. If you get into a case and uh, let's say that you're, you're pretty proficient, but you have a case that's going to require extracting all the teeth that you've either evaluated and you're going right into the procedure or you've evaluated and you're getting back, you can certainly let the owner know that this is very likely going to be multiple uh, or two procedures that will need to get the patient back in a month and do the, the other side. <clears throat> the ideal thing is to do everything at once. It's one anesthesia. It's easier for you. It's easier for the patient. It's easier for the owner. If you can do it, it's obviously better to do it in one go. The patient parameters from a physiologic standpoint are super important. And that's where our super light anesthetic regimen, where we have a palpebral reflex and we have a patient that is breathing rapidly, we've got blood pressure that's normal, <clears throat> all the physiologic parameters are great and they're warm. If all those things are okay, you can continue even two, three hour procedures and be super safe as long as you take vigilance in how that patient's doing from all aspects of monitoring. And we do that in our practice if we can on every patient. We want those patients out and back to the owner and we don't have to bring them back for another induction and another recovery, which is in, indeed time consuming and as far as anesthesiologists go, the most critical part of the anesthetic procedure. So we want to eliminate that if we can. But if you can't, you can't. And those are the circumstances where you might want to stage the procedure. So great question there. Amy, uh, is Doxyro better beneficial for use without bone graft material? Uh, would you still place sutures to hold it in place? And that has been updated recently and we'll discuss that at some point in the future in other uh, cases or podcasts. And 
to answer that question in a brief synopsis, there was a study done, the New York, uh, the AMC in New York City, Django Martell and his colleagues did a study that looked at doxyrope and looked at uh, clindoral after root planing and subgingival curatage for defects in attached gingiva with probing that were abnormal. And they found that there's no benefit to doxyrobe or clindoral in the pocket versus root planing and scaling alone. We've used doxyrobe for years for that, but we don't use it anymore based on that study. So that's a personal decision and it's based on research that was done by veterinary dentists, PhDs, and they did a, the, the research model was very well formed and constructed. So that's how we approach our cases now. We don't use doxyrobe for that. We do use it for uh, a membrane on top of our bone grafts. Megan, similar question, what is the success rate between using a blood clot naturally and the bone graft material? Does this increase patient comfort and quicken healing? So in response to both of those questions, the success rate with a blood clot and bone graft are similar. The healing doesn't happen any faster with a bone graft. It may be a little slower, actually. But the benefit of the bone graft is that that bone graft allows us to place that bone graft material up to the level of the marginal bone. And if it's at that level, and if it's got good structure to it, like console does, or Synergy does, or other compounds where it fills the alveolus and it can't be compressed by any stretch, <clears throat> then it stays at that marginal bone level and then that's where the bone graft will fill. Blood clots will retract some. So in a year, research shows in humans, uh, over and over again, <clears throat> periodontal research from many decades back that Blood clots are great bone grafts, but you're going to get some organization of that blood clot, and you're going to lose one to two millimeters of bone as it organizes and retracts from the margin of the bone that otherwise is maintained by your bone graft. So most cases don't require bone grafts in extraction sites. The time when you would put one in is when you've got an adjacent tooth that's close that you can imagine might be compromised from that bone being lost in that six months to a year time, one to two millimeters on that tooth that's adjacent to it. So that's when you wouldn't want to, uh, to do that. Or that's when you would want to use a bone graft. I'm curious how often you end up using bone grafts and in which cases it seems so much easier to extract the tooth in the dog. So let's go to, um, let's, let's look at all these questions. Haley, uh, that was from Cathal again. Haley, do you use bone grafts in dogs a lot more than cats? Yes, we do. Um, would you extract M2 root planing and clindoral? Uh, we don't use clindoral um, and it, it is of no benefit uh, at, at, uh, at all. Doxyrobe is the membrane that you would use for that. So let's go back to bone grafting being an option and this is kind of a continuation of what we talked about with the case where we were looking at the cat where we had bone loss and we couldn't do anything to alter it so this is one of those cases where we really this is what this is the case that she had and this one you can see that there is uh, bone loss in the frication, there's bone loss here. In order to get this out where it's not going to progress, you've got to open this up. You've got to have a flap all the way down to here. Clean all this out, get the flap back up, and be comfortable that you've sutured it correctly and it's going to adhere to, to the um, new bone level, which is down here. So you're, you're dropping that down a little bit. 
and again that's an advanced procedure so this is not something you do in practice so in in this case this is an extraction because you cannot do anything at all to alter the progression of that even if you clean it out and you're successful cleaning it out which is not something that you want to do then closing that back up like it was before and expecting this to work without the owner coming back every four months to have this have this cleaned out here at the very least but here as well you're you're never going to be on top of this where it's not going to come back in that short period of time so you don't want to have the patient coming back that often the owner's not going to want to have that patient come back that often for one tooth or so <clears throat> unless they do <laughs> and if they do then that is a referral and so that's the criteria that you need to use can i alter this so that it won't progress and I can get this patient back in a reasonable period of time. Not four months, not six months, but a year uh, or six months in a, in a small breed dog, which probably anyway needs to be the case. Uh, a year is too long and any small breed dog starting at 18 months of age, they should be in at least uh, every 10 to six months for cleaning, evaluation, x-rays periodically. That one year recommendation, that's not something that we want to make for the patients that are less than 20 pounds and certainly not for patients that are 12 pounds or less 10 pounds or less those need to come in starting young if the owners want to do it and save the teeth every six months at minimum let's say so that's in general and that's counter to what everything you've heard but that's just the way it is we know that those patients cannot go longer or they're going to have bone loss progression so that's, that's how you want to approach these, and uh, certainly a, not enough time to really go into detail on that, but uh, that's the way that you want to approach those. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash inv.